and do song leading, and I didn't realize just what a task that was, but uh, I appreciate how he did it. He set a good example for me to just be more. We're going to sing number 378 to start off with. All four verses. <laughs> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust a sweetest friend, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand.
reading this morning from 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. Reading from the New International Version. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection <coughs> of Jesus Christ from the dead and into, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through the faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an express, expressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And when they spoke of these things, they have been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even the angels long to look into these things. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set, set your hope fully on the grace to be given. And when Jesus Christ is revealed as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so holy in you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from an empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living, enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Shall we pray? Our God and Father in heaven, Lord, we come before that throne of mercy, thanking thee, Father, for yet another opportunity that we have to come to this place of comfort, to sing songs of praise and glory to thy name's honor, to hear another lesson from thy word, Father. We thank thee for these blessings, for we know that we are the stewards of these gifts, and we pray that we'll always use them in a manner that's well pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. We're thankful for the love that you've given us, Father, and we 
pray that we will always show the love and the kindness that you have put in our hearts to others that we come in contact with that they might see you through the way that we act. Pray that we'll be with this congregation, be with the elders as they guide the congregation, may we always be alive in the community. We're thankful for Brother Bob and Brother Matt and for their families that support us, Father. We pray that you will always continue to be with them, that you will give them many, many years of long service in our work. Pray for those who are preaching and teaching the sound doctrine of thy word in difficult and dangerous places. We pray that you will give them the knowledge, the wisdom, the resources, and the ability to plant that seed, Father, that you may get the increase. We pray for those who are fighting for our freedom, Father. We pray that you will comfort them, be with them, and bring them home safely. We're mindful of those who mentioned as being sick and unable to attend. We pray that you will be with them and be with those in ministry. Care. At this time, we pray a special prayer for Brother Chad, Father. We pray that you will be with the doctors, the nurses, and the family that will that will comfort and care for him, that he may be restored back to a better quality than he's currently in. Pray that you continue to watch over us, that you will care for us, forgive us where we fail, please. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Bear in mind the Lord's Supper this morning. We're going to sing all four verses of number 167, We Saw Thee Not. This song talks about the life of Christ, his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, and of course, and the Lord's Supper, we think of all of those things and we look forward to his coming again. And, and so uh, this song reminds me of a lot of things that I think about during the Lord's Supper. Let's sing it from the heart as we sing as we should all the time. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy body's home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps draw. Ah! Uh -huh. 
to, uh, I'm going to be reading from uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Take some thoughts from there as a kind of a center point. Before I read or anything, does everybody have a communion uh, emblem? If you don't, we'll give it to you. Corinthians 11 26 is, says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's <coughs> death till he comes. Part of the thought this morning is why do we proclaim God's Christ's death? Why do we uh, remember him? Why was it necessary for him to die? From the very beginning of time, when Adam and Eve was in the garden, when Adam and Eve was in the garden of Eden, there was a separation between man and uh, God. And uh, somehow we needed forgiveness for that sin. It's, it's quite obvious that, that there was, there was a, a sacrifice needed. We give me uh, it's a uh, right down but we know that Cain and Abel they they both presented a, a, a sacrifice one was acceptable Abel was accepted Cain was not accepted by God uh, it had to be done in, in accordance to the way God wanted it that sacrifice to be given for him and and throughout eternity, throughout time, we mankind has always tried to you know, go before God and say, what can I do to get forgiveness of those things that I've done wrong? What, how, how am I going to do that? And, of course, in the, when Moses came, God revealed that the way the sacrifices that, he, that man was to present. And, and we have all through the Old Testament... Uh, people going through the act of going to the priests, going to the Levites, going and, and going to the altars and preparing that sacrifice and there had to be blood. And here recently we've uh, been uh, studying in well, Wednesday night the book of John and we see the the priests, the Levites, the Pharisees, the leadership of the Jews being hypocritical um, in the way that where there should have been a, a connection between man and God, they were a barrier. They were a barrier. We we read about the money changers and and Jesus chasing the money changers out of the temple and these and you, and if you don't know these were folks there that kind of served a purpose but they took it too far when, if if I came to Jerusalem and I needed to, to, to offer a sacrifice and I didn't have one well at least I had some money I could buy one but they were taken too too far. There was a there is a, a video out, it's called The Shepherd. And and, and it relates I call I call him the misfits shepherd. He he brings and you think about the commercialism of what all has to happen. These people in Jerusalem, the money changers, had to have a, a sacrifice had to have an acceptable sacrifice. They, and so this shepherd, the misfit shepherd, what I call him, he was trying to do right. He had a little sheep that he brought all the way from wherever it was. In the story, this is around Bethlehem. And he, but he brings his sheep, and along the way, it gets a prick. There's a thorn or something. Of it. This little white sheep, when it gets to the, 
to the money changer. A money changer is buying a sheep from the shepherd so that he can have it ready for the traveler who is going to be wherever and needs a, a sacrifice. Well, the Pharisee who is looking at this sheep, I mean, they're looking, he's holding this thing up, this sheep up, this little white sheep. And this, this little white sheep, it got a prick. And what do you do when you get a prick? You bleed. And it's a white sheep. It had a red spot on it just as plain as day. Well, he threw the sheep out. He threw it back to the shepherd. And he not only criticized the quality of the sheep, he, quali he, he, he condemned the, the shepherd for being an inferior shepherd. He condemned the shepherd for being an inferior Jew, not knowing what an acceptable sacrifice is. He basically told him to get out of town. I don't want to see you anymore. He um, he told the shepherd that you know you're you're not worth two cents. You you you're no good. And don't come back to me until you have accept, an acceptable sacrifice. This is what I'm saying that the Pharisees, the Jewish leadership, they become a judge in between the people and God. They, they judge the shepherd as inferior. Of course, he did have an unacceptable sacrifice, but he, they belittled him, and and it, just being at Bethlehem, you can know the rest of the story. That he was one of the shepherds that went to to that night. In the story, this is not. This is just a lot of assumptions and based upon what the scripture says. But the shepherd finds a real quality sacrifice in Jesus. And there at the end of the, of the video, it, and the Pharisee confronts him again. He said, get out of town. Did I not tell you before you come back, you need to have a real sacrifice. And, he, and then the light goes off. I have a sacrifice that's greater than the sheep, that's greater than anything that, that you've seen here. Why did Jesus come? Because he is better than all the sheep, all the goats, all the bulls, doves, pigeons, whatever there is, he is far better. And the reason I came to Hebrews 10, it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and, a, and not the very image of things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they also continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For them would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers once purified would have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Continue on verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, that's Jesus Christ, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not deserve, des desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, you have no pleasure. I then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do your will, O God. Verse 8. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, but had pleasure in them that which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. O oh God, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Why did Jesus have to come? Why do we proclaim his death? Because he makes us right with God. He wipes away those sins. As we remember the bread that represents the body, 
the blood, the, uh, the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. Let's remember the great sacrifice. He took away that partition. He took away the Pharisees and the, and the, the leadership. We can now go directly to God through him. He's not a barrier any longer for the, his children. And just be thankful we have his blood and his body that was given for us. And there's no one else that stands between us and God. If you will, bow with me uh, as we, before we take of the bread. Uh, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we can call upon you as a father. We're thankful that you're a kind and forgiving God, but yet we know that you are a righteous and holy God and and that there will be judgment. But Lord, we come to thee through your son's name, Jesus, and we recognize that you gave him to die on the cross, and that this bread represents that body that he hung upon the cross, that, that we might be forgiven. As we partake of it, may we, may we reflect back upon the cross, may we examine ourselves and, and, and remember him every day of our life. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Apart from the what we call the Lord's Supper, um, we're commanded to give back to, to the Lord part of what you, He's given to us. Um, and these, there's baskets on the exit doors um, where you can put your, your offering. Um, before we go back to our song service, let's, let's give thanks for the blessing. Father, we again come to you in prayer. And we thank you for the many blessings you've given us, particularly here in this area of your, of your not just the necessities of life, which, but uh, we have all these in abundance. Lord, we pray that, uh, that help us to give back cheerfully. Uh, be with the uh, leaders of the church that they may use it wisely and according to your will, that your kingdom might be served and that it, that it would grow. And uh, Lord, just be with us all as we go out through this day, this coming week. Forgive us where we, we have failed you. And this we pray in Christ's name. Matt brings us the lesson this morning. We're going to sing number two, Hallelujah, Praise and Hope. It's actually Psalms 148 turned into a song. So if you get a chance later today, look at Psalms 148. And uh, it's amazing how many of these words out of that song that we sing in this song, Praise God. Those who would like may stand at this time as we sing this song.
Good morning. Uh, certainly glad to see everybody, especially those that are visitors with us, and we are thankful for you that you're here. And again, we extend a, a welcome to you at any chance that you have to visit with us here at, at Mount Zion. A while back, I saw a, a 
news broadcast uh, and that was posted that discussed that religion uh, being on a decline in America. And I read an article uh, that talked about that one in four Americans are, are not affiliated with any religion. Of course, that's up from previous, previous results. And uh, one article that I read also said that the Church of Christ, that it lost one in eight members, ever, uh, that it loses one in eight members since 1990. And another article I read was it talked about why the churches of Christ uh, are shrinking. And uh, in its premise, as you can see, that it fails to recognize the, says that the, the, the Church of Christ it fails to recognize the culture shift that's going on. That it, that young people that they're looking for for an experience. And said claims that the Church of Christ will lose many uh, people who are 18 to 35 year old because of the push for the experience that they that they should get. Do you agree with that? Do you wonder about that? You know, we live in an experience driven culture, and people value experiences, don't they? They advance the, the experience. Think about Disney. Think about other theme parks. Concerts, movie theaters. Why do people come back? Because of the experience. There's no wonder why we see that, that the people that are looking for an experience-driven church, and in those experiences, we see that they're, they're motivated by, by how you feel. Does service, does it move you? Are you moved when you hear? Is there some emotion that's going on? I believe... Uh, Brother Nathan, I think he said it, or someone I was talking with said, you know, they're looking for the emotion and not necessarily the faith. That they have, the young folks that they have, uh, maybe, and, and other people as well, not just the young ones, that we equate our faith with how much emotion that we can get out of something. Before you arrived this morning, were you saying, as the psalmist said in Psalms 122, verse 1, were you saying, I was glad when they said to us, let us go into the house of the Lord. Were you, did, was your mind set when you come this morning? Or was it like, it's Sunday, it's church day, got to go, got to be there, parents are making me come. When we leave, when we leave, can we say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why are we here? But Jimmy did a good job with, with, the, of the, Lord's Supper, with the Lord's Supper talk. Why are we, why are we we're celebrating the Lord's death. We're here also praying together, lifting each other up. The list of individuals that we call out, that sit, that needs our prayers. We're here to encourage one another and to build up the church. You know, that the, the, the trend sometimes that we see and, and that, we, that we need to get back to is that we need to get back to the Bible. We need to see that there, that there are many, in many churches there is, there's an apathy. We attend churches and we attend service. But sometimes it's, we're just going through the motions. We're motionless. When we have so much to have emotion about. Not the experience of I feel good when I come. Because you know what? Sometimes when whenever when Brother Bob or when someone else is up here giving a talk and it steps on my toes, I may not like it, but I know it's good for me. I know it's good for my soul. I know it's good when the Bible teaches me that, you know what, Matt? You need to straighten up a little bit. You need, to, you need to be on that straight and narrow and quit wandering, looking off in other directions. When we go through the motions, how's our singing? If we're singing at all. How's our praise? How's our Bible study during the week if we're just going through the motions? What about the zeal that we have? What about the zeal you had when you became a Christian? The zeal that I had when I became a Christian. How excited were you for God? How on fire were you for God? And sometimes what we see is that we get a little sluggish, don't we? We get a little sluggish, but God desires more for his children, doesn't he? In Romans 15, verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and, and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through what? 
through the power of the Holy Ghost. The problem we see sometimes is <clears throat> similar to that in an athlete that's in a slump. You're just kind of going through the motions sometimes, and, but you're not performing to your true potential. What do you do when you're in a slump? You get back to the basics. You get back to the fundamentals. You get back as Christians, we get back to the Bible. We get back to the Bible. We've been reading in Revelations chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. What was he saying to, to the church at Ephesus there? He said, nevertheless, he said, I have somewhat against you because what? You left your first love. He says, remember therefore whence you're fallen, he says, and you repent and you do the first works. Or else I will come to thee quickly and I will remove the candlestick out of this place except you repent. You see, we need to get back to the Bible. And we do that by, by energizing our faith. And we know that we can look at in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, when we pour ourselves into the Scriptures, we can see that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. It's that firm conviction. It's that, that confident trust that we have in God. We know how important that our faith is. We know that uh, in Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, what? It's impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, faith in Jesus is essential. It's essential and for us in, in finding forgiveness and in, in, in finding eternal life. When we look at John chapter 8 and verse 24, he says, If ye believe not that I am he, what's going to happen? He said, You're going to die in your sins. Without fear, what do we have? Without faith, what do we have? we have? We have fear. We can look at Peter. We can look at Peter and we can see what Peter did in Matthew chapter 14. What did he do? Listen to what Jesus said. He said, but when he saw the wind and the boisterous, he was afraid. He began to sink. He cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. He called him and he said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt? If you're, uh, if you're walking and you're going toward Jesus, why do we fear? Why do we doubt? Because that's what Satan wants us to do. But we can have it, and we can energize our faith knowing that when our eyes are on him, when we're walking the path with him, he is there and his hand is there, ready to reach out and grab us whenever we need it. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we know that faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? The hearing, the word of God. We can see in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, Many other signs that Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Can you believe that? That what we have, it can't even hold what he would, what if he, we were writing down everything that he did. It couldn't hold. There's not a book possible to hold what he's given us. I doubt even the internet. I know the internet couldn't even hold possible what Jesus did in his lifetime. He said, but what he did right, what he did right, what is he gave us, it says it was written that we might believe who? We might believe in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and believing, in, believing that we might have life through his name. You see, we want to energize our faith. We do that by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. When our faith is in him, we can have a, we can have a joyful experience if you want an experience here. Because when we come here, we come here with sad hearts sometimes. When we come here, we come here, and it, it might be because of the death of a loved one. It might be because of something going on in your family. It might be something because of a child that's disappointed you. It might be that you've lost your job. It might be that you're just struggling in sin. But we come here sometimes brokenhearted and down. Why? We come here because we come to the hospital. We come to the great physician. We come to Jesus Christ. We come to him because that's the one that gives us the experience when we're here. Not the songs, the clapping, or whatever it is that might else entertain us when we're here. Because when we're here, it's not to be entertained. That's not the purpose of coming to church. The purpose is to do the will of the Father, just like it was Jesus' purpose to do the will of the Father. We have to pour our minds and our hearts into the study of this book. And in doing that, we, we, we energize our faith. And we also fortify or we strengthen our hope. You find yourself in a spiritual slump, pick up your Bible. Pick up your Bible. 
Allow it to rebuild that confident trust that you once had. Because it will help you. It will strengthen you. It will fortify you. It will protect you. It will protect me from the attacks that is on our hope. Those attacks that come from Satan. You know, when we think about hope, we think about hope, and, and, it says, and Vine says that hope is the, the happy anticipation of good. The happy anticipation of good. It's not wishful thinking. It's not an insecure, I hope so. It is a confident expectation. It is a desire plus an expectation. That's what hope is. And as Christians, when we come here and we are brokenhearted and we, we need forgiveness, we need and the things that we need and the things that we know, the cares of this world that bog us down, we come here to be strengthened. We come here to be lifted up. We come here because of the hope that we have. It causes us to persevere. It causes us to keep on going. In Romans 8, 25, But if we have hope that we see not, then we do with patience, we wait for it. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience in what? In hope of whom? In our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God, our Father. It motivates us. Our hope, it motivates us to become pure. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, The love now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear that we shall be, but we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him. Ain't that beautiful? We will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man, not just one, every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself. We make sure that we're pure as he is what? As he is pure. As we read this morning, he is holy for what? We are holy because he is holy. We have opportunities to, to preach and, and to teach. And, and because of that hope that is in us, we're able to give an answer to people. Because the, when they ask us a reason of the hope that is in us in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15. How do we do that? How do we strengthen our hope? We strengthen our hope. Just like we strength energize our faith through this good book. The Word of God. The Word of God, it will produce that hope. And in Romans 15, verse 4, what did he say? For whatever thing was written aforetime, it was written for what? Our learning. That what? That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. You want your faith energized? You want your hope for strengthened and fortified? Right here's the experience you need. It's this good book right here. We know that God keeps his promises. He will deliver on his promises that he makes to us. We can see that Peter, he encourages us too in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. He's told him, you, work, you gird up the loins of your mind. And he says, and you be so, and you hope. You hope what? You hope to the end for the grace that is there brought into you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We hope to the end, to the very end, because that's where our prize is. The prize is in the very end. When an athlete, when they get discouraged, when you have a group of, of, of young people that are, that are playing, you have people that are cheering for them, they're cheering them on, not giving up, you're down by three. You're just going to quit? No, you're going to keep playing until when? You're going to keep playing until the, buzz, the last buzzer sounds. And for us as Christians, we cannot give up that hope. We can't give up that hope until the last buzzer sounds, until we're called home. Because we will run with patience, won't we? In Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, we'll run with patience. That's race that's set before us, looking to who? Looking to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Not only do we energize our faith, not only do we fortify our hope, but we have to activate love. When we turn the Bibles and we can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Please turn with me there. You probably can you probably got it memorized by now. 
At 1 Corinthians chapter 13, one of the most beautiful passages, and the people use it in weddings, they use, but it's the description of what love is. Love and our charity it suffers long, it's kind, it's, it, it envies not, charity vaunted not itself, it's not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, it seeks not her own, it's not easily provoked, it thinks no evil, it rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. When you think about love, what does it do? It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. When we think about love, we love, know that love, it never fails. You want to get back. You want to have, you want to have an experience. Then you activate your love. The love right here that, that is demonstrated. The love right here that is, that is description of, of what a perfect love will be. You think about that, you can enter, you can exchange that, take out that word charity, take out that word love, and you insert Jesus, and what do you got? You've got God as love, don't you? What about if you insert my name, Matt, Matt, into all those things? Does Matt, can you know, Matt check off all those things on his life, that that's what he does? Can you check off your name that that's what you do? Does that a description of you whenever you look at that love? When we activate our love toward others, what do we see? We see an active goodwill toward, uh, toward men, don't we? Why is love so important? Why is love so important? We can look and we can turn to 1 first, first John chapter 3. We can look at verse 14. What does he say? He says, We know that we have passed from death into life because why? We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides, abides in death. Skipping down to verse 18, what do you say? He says, My little children, love, uh, let us love not in word. Don't just love in word. And don't just love in tongue. Sometimes I have to aggravate Leah just a little bit. She says, I love you. I said, that's just three words. What do I say? Because I'm just aggravating her. But that's, sometimes people can say, I love you. Do they really mean it? How do you know they love you? But if they demonstrate that to you. He says, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. How did Jesus love how did God love? He loved us by being killed on the cross. Sacrifice. He loved us this much, didn't he? He loved us this much. That's enough. That, that experience should drive us to some emotion. That experience is what we need. Not the experience that we're getting by just saying, I'm, just, I'm moved by, by, the, by the service. We're moved by Jesus. We're moved by God. We're moved by the Holy Spirit. When we think about our love and the importance of love, we think about it in 1 John 3 as we go down there in that chapter and look in verse 22. He says, And whatever we ask, we ask of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. He says, This is the commandment. This is the commandment. You should believe in the name of Jesus Christ and what? And love one another. As he gave us commandment. You see, when we abide in him, he abides in us. We see that in 1 John 4. When we look at verse 7, it's beloved, let us love, uh, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows, and knows God. If you love not, you don't know God. Why? Because God is love. When we think about activating our love, and we think about thinking about um, what Jesus taught and what God taught, and we think about the Thessalonians in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 9, when he says, But as touching whether we love, you need not that I write unto you. I don't need to write to you, said that brother love. You for yourselves are taught that of God to love one another. And I can tell you that's one thing that I admire, and that I think that when I think about the church here at, at Mount Zion. You show love toward others. I believe we are a congregation that our love is activated because of the love of Christ. When we have need here, you just mention it and it's taken care of. Just like Brother Randall said about, about Brother Tim. He said, hey, you know what? I think I'll need some meals for this week. Boom, just like that. Sent out a message about um, about, Chris, about some uh, students in Limestone County that, that needed some help with Christmas. Boom, just like that. Maybe there's just a few, but just just like that. When we had the um, when we had the drive for um, for the um, it was 
to the hurricane relief or for whatever it was that we had. Buku's truckload, um, we had a truckload of things that was donated and given because of the activation of your love, because you know that you're letting your light shine for God. Those are things that we do, that we do for others. Why? Because we know that we've been blessed, but also because he's a blessing to us, we can be a blessing to someone else. We can look and we can think about the joy that we have. We think about the, the joy that we have as we get back to the Bible. As we get to back to the Bible and we can think, and, and as, when we think about the, about the word joy too, and you think about the word, word grace, and grace we know is an undeserved favor, which in turn it should give us joy, right? It should give us joy, it should give us pleasure, it should give us delight. So then joy then is the response to that undeserved favor that we get. We should be joyful. Why? Because of the precious gift of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of gifts on the wish list. But the best gift that you and I have ever received and the people act that live on after us, that the world stands, that they will ever receive is the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. Of all the people in the world, we as Christians have the biggest motivation to be joyful. We have a Savior who died for us, the one who paid the price for us so that we don't have to. When we think of that, we read in Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When we think about 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 6, Wherein can you, you greatly rejoice? Why? We rejoice, why? Because of the grand. That's what was read this morning. That through a season, now for a season you need be the heaviest uh, heaviness. Uh, through the manifold uh, temptations, that, that the trial of your faith, the trial of our faith, going back to the very beginning, we talked about faith, Mom. he says, going to the trial of your faith, being more precious than gold. The trial of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes, that may try the fire, that may be found in the praise and honor and glory of the, uh, the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. In whom though you have not seen yet, yet you yet believe him. And you rejoice with what? With joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith. Even what? The salvation of your soul. When we enhance our joy, what are we going to have? We're going to have a home with God. Our souls are going to be saved. You know, and it's often the loss of that virtue that's the most evident in the lives of Christians. It's that's the experience that should drive us. Is the one of Jesus Christ. That's, their, that's our driving motivation. He's the driving experience. He, 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 when we think about Jesus and, and what he did, we think about in, in John chapter going on in John sixteen verse twenty four. He says, "Hitherto have you have you nothing uh, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask and you shall receive it, that your joy may be full." Sometimes we ask and we don't receive, and we think that God's not listening, or if we get disappointed. It just may be that it's not His will. It may be that it's not the time right now for that. But the joy we have in Him. Is the joy at the end of our faith. You may not get it. May, it, may, it may not be an easy life. But I can guarantee if you live a faithful life, you're going to have joy just like you look at the rich man and wife. Says, who had the joy? It was the one who was humble. It was the one who, 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 who was the example of what Jesus wants us to be. You know what? And then you can enjoy peace, can't you? When we do those things, we can enjoy peace. The practice of daily Bible study, getting us back to back, getting us back to the Bible, 
is also using that habit of prayer. And how basic is that? What an easy avenue to talk to the Father. Why is that possible? Again, it's because of Jesus Christ. We talk to him. Why does it in the name of Jesus or in Jesus' name what? I pray. Why? It's, we go through him. There's harmony in the world, right? No. There's harmony among the nations. No. There's harmony among men. No. Can there be harmony between God and man? Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Going again back to Romans chapter 14. Looking at 17 through 19, 4, it says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Again, what does he say? It's righteousness and what? And peace. It's righteousness and peace. He says, For he that is in these things serves Christ, is acceptable to God, and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. We follow after the things that make for peace. And things wherewith what? We can edify one another. We can have peace in, in following Jesus Christ. We can have peace in, in pleasing God. We can have peace even from our enemies. You can see in Proverbs 16, verse 7, what does he say? When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. There is so much joy that we can have in this world and so much joy that we can have as we think about our faith. As we think about our hope. We think about the love that we should have, the joy that we should have, the peace that we have. Why are these things sometimes in the lives of Christians in short supply? And we can't say because it's in a ship out on uh, on, on the. Uh, Pacific Ocean, or out there on the, you know, out there beside uh, California. We can't say that. We can't say that because someone hadn't, uh, someone else hasn't taken it off that ship. If we don't have these things, it's because of me. It's because of you. Because these things in the life of a Christian, these things are abundant. Of the life of Jesus, what Jesus did for us. We don't want to neglect God's tools. We don't want to neglect the Word of God. We don't want to neglect this book because it has the words of eternal life. We don't want to neglect prayer because in prayer, what can we do? We can energize our faith. We can fortify our hope. We can't activate our love. We can't enhance joy. We can't enjoy that peace. That peace that comes through Jesus Christ. In James 1.21, what did he say? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save souls. Continue, he said in Colossians 4 2, you continue in prayer and you watch the same with thanksgiving, he says. It's, pretty, it's that simple, isn't it? Because I'm telling you, living a life, living life, I didn't say it's going to be easy. But what I am going to tell you is that it's worth it. It's worth it. Living a Christian life is so worth it. When we look at John 6, Jesus feeds 5,000. He heals the sick. He raises people from the dead. People flock to him. <clears throat> In that same chapter, Jesus challenges them. And what happens? Some leave and they stop following him. Will you also go away? We don't want to be one of those statistics. Nor do we want our friends and our family members to be statistics. As, I read, as, I, as we talked about at the very beginning. We want to have our faith anchored into the rock. Romans 5, 8, but God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? 
He died for us. And as we took it our life this morning, it may be that there may be something amiss in our life that we need to ask forgiveness for. Don't be ashamed. Coming forward is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength because you know who to go to. If you're not a child of God, please become one. We, there is no, nothing in this life that we, you can do better for yourself than to have your sins washed away and become a child of God. Think about those things, and if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come as we stand and as we sing the invitation song? Well, sometimes I hear him in